Thing. Wonderful. We've got a few people here. Um, I'm going to start with our little intro uh, while we wait for some more people to sign into our event. Um, my name is Rhea Cohn, and I'm the volunteer and outreach coordinator here at the Swanner Preserve and Eco Center. Uh, Hunter Klingensmith is also here. She's our visitor experience coordinator. Uh, thanks, guys, for signing into our first virtual webinar. Seems to be going well. We're excited to have you guys here. Um, there's a chat feature and a Q&A feature on the side of WebEx. So please leave any questions or comments in there. Um, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the event uh, and everyone can kind of chime in to answer questions. Um, I'm gonna have a quick clarifying question. We won't interrupt everybody. Um, but this is science in your backyard community science panel. So we at Swanner were really excited about bringing community and citizen science to the Wasatch back um, and sharing projects that we're really passionate about. Um, so I want to introduce our panelists. First of all, we have they'll all be speaking and can talk about the projects that they have specifically, but we have um, Hope Braithwaite here, who is the director, um, the coordinator of Utah Water Watch, uh, which we participate in at the preserve. Um, we have Ellen Erickson, who's the citizen science coordinator at the Natural History Museum of Utah, and Rebecca Ray, who is a citizen scientist extraordinaire. Um, so everyone will be talking kind of about their experiences in citizen and community science. We'll be using both of those terms interchangeably. They both mean the same thing, um, both citizen and community science. Um, each organization uses one or the other. We at Swanner tend to use a little bit of both. Um, but what is community or citizen science? I wanted to kind of touch on just moving forward. So um, it's basically research conducted by the public, um, not everybody has to be a science, a scientist or have a degree in science to participate in scientific research um, by kind of outsourcing to the public. Uh, scientists and researchers are able to gather a lot more data or go through a lot more data. Um, so we can participate in these projects, provide our manpower, our time, our passion, our energy um, to further scientific research. Um, so at the Swanner Preserve and Eco Center, we currently don't have any super specific projects that we've created or spearheaded, but participate in a few. Um, so we participate in the Western Firefly Project uh, from the Natural History Museum. So hopefully this summer we'll be out on some firefly walks. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about these projects from the other panelists. Uh, we do participate in Utah Water Watch, as I mentioned which um, tracks water quality, uh, which we're really passionate about on our wetland preserve. Uh, we use iNaturalist as well, which, you're, which you'll hear all about today. Um, and we'll have an event in conjunction with the City Nature Challenge, which is coming up, where we'll be using iNaturalist uh, out on the preserve. We'll take you out there virtually. Um, so you can look for that later this month. But I wanna pass it on to Ellen talk a little bit about her role and her community science. So feel free to ask questions and we'll get those at the end. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rhea. And really thanks to you and to Hunter and to everyone at Swanner for, for inviting us to join and be here for this exciting topic. Citizen science is very near and dear to my heart and uh, I feel pretty lucky that I get to do it as part of my job on a daily basis. And so Thanks for inviting me to be here. And also thanks for having such an awesome panel. I'm excited to be here with Hope and also with Rebecca who are two wonderful humans as well. Um, so I am the citizen science coordinator at the Natural History Museum and the museum uses citizen science in uh, several different ways. One is to help enhance and do research at the museum, but also we use it as a community outreach tool. And so we're using it to engage members of the public in various ways. And so I get to play um, those roles. I do a lot of outreach and I collaborate with a lot with scientists um, at the museum, which is a pretty exciting thing. So I've got a, a 
presentation here. I'm going to pull up my sharing my screen. And it should be up. Okay, cool. So here's my intro slide. <laughs> uh, so given the given the title of the, the webinar talking about science in your backyard, it's a perfect topic for citizen science and an excellent thing to talk about this time of year. Um, I'm going to talk about some citizen science things you can do outside that the museum uh, is involved with, but I'm also going to talk about a little bit of citizen science you could do from inside your home as well. Um, so Ria touched on this citizen science is basically any time members of the public, so people just like you who are collaborating with professionally trained scientists. So people who have gone to school and, and learned about specific topics and, and do that for their day job. Um, it's a really a cool thing. We mentioned this, you can help scientists by being their eyes and their ears and being places that they cannot be all the time, uh, which can be really helpful with certain projects as you'll see um, as, as I'm talking. Um, but it's also a great way for members of the public to become engaged in the scientific process and learn more about their surroundings. And so some of my favorite things that surround citizen science have to do with that sort of stuff. It really connects people with the scientific process. It gives people a sense of place and ownership of ideas and the things that are around them. Um, and it's a pretty awesome thing to do with people outside or inside. It's obviously a hands-on thing. You're participating in some sort of scientific process. Um, and then it re can relate to many forms of science. Citizen science isn't just relating to things that are, uh, for example, biology, where you're studying things outside or you're looking at plants and animals. Citizen science can engage scientific research happening in space. It can, it can have, you can be studying um, things in the medical field. There are a lot of different ways that citizen science can contribute to the scientific community, which is pretty cool. Um, and and my slide here says expands possibilities, and I mentioned this really being able to it allows researchers the ability to connect with the community uh, in their nearby place, but also beyond to conduct research that they wouldn't be able to do because maybe they don't have the funds to travel to a certain place, or uh, maybe they're studying something that lives in a whole bunch of different places and, and scientists can't get there, professionally trained scientists couldn't get there, and so citizen scientists are perfect for that. Um, and then citizen science is really inclusive, which I think is my favorite thing. Really, anybody can be a citizen scientist. And so it doesn't matter who you are, where you live, truly, really, really what your age is and your physical abilities, you can be a citizen scientist. Really, all you need to do is be observant of your surroundings and passionate about maybe learning to help uh, learn more about them or um, protect them and get engaged in some way. So I'm going to talk about a few different projects that the Natural History Museum runs, uh, specifically specifically for, um, and then I'll throw in a little bit of an extra at the end too, but that's where I'm going to go in my presentation today. And I'm going to try to put links at the bottom of my slides to our website, and so if you're curious about where that this stuff lives, and you can go, uh, go to the website and read all about it. So the first project I want to touch on is the citizen science um, effort that we are using the public or helping the public is helping us uh, transcribe some digital records that the museum has. So basically, the museum is working on digitizing a lot of our collections. And so some of that, you know, dinosaur bones and specimens of insects and plants, uh, but some of that also uh, involves field notes from researchers from years and years and years of scientific data. And a lot of those notes are just notebooks, stacks and stacks of notebooks. And so those are getting scanned by staff at the museum. Once they're scanned, they go onto a uh, web server that anybody can access. This is part of uh, the link that you can get to on our website. And once you're there, you can pull up a record and what we need help with is transcribing these written records into digital text. And so that way, when somebody wants to research, uh, for example, Robins, they could go into this online uh, collection, search for the word Robin and as a keyword, and any of these handwritten notes that involve, that that's use Robin will come up because somebody's gone in and typed out all of the text that's there. And so, 
it's an incredibly helpful thing. Um, and then obviously will be something that lasts forever. And so it helps these notes to take in, um, in this one, I think the date says 1934, uh, live on and be useful um, for many, many more years to come, which is pretty exciting. Um, it's also a really great way to <laughs> exercise your brain. The people wrote differently. And so the it's like, it's hard to read some of the cursive. So if you would like a little challenge, um, your brain it feels kind of it feels kind of cool to go through and, and transcribe all of these things so far this year we've already had 186 citizen scientists help us with the project and they've already transcribed over 6,000 pages but there are so many more that we need transcribed so this is a wonderful a wonderful thing you could easily help with from inside your home another project that we are running at the museum involves studying a invasive insect it's or an introduced insect to utah i should say it's called the firebug. The European firebug looks kind of similar to a box elder bug at first glance. They're very similar sizes um, and they have some sort of similar coloring. As you can see from this slide here, they're a little more red than orange. The European firebug also has some uh, circle markings on its back that the, the box elder bug does not. Um, if you or if your house or school or workplace is like mine, there are box elder bugs all over the place outside, um, especially in my garage during the spring, summer, and fall, just en masse. And sometimes there'll be a firebug sort of mixed in with all of that. The museum is tracking the expansion of this introduced species using the iNaturalist platform. Um, it's a free online tool that is amazing at capturing worldwide biodiversity and essentially a user, you, me, anybody who has an account on iNaturalist, which is easy to make, um, you take a photo of any wild living thing that you see, in this case, a firebug, and save it to the site and it becomes a data point. It's marked on a map as with that photo of that insect in that place during that at that time. And so that becomes pretty amazing data for tracking a species that is expanding all over the state. And so the European firebug is native to Europe, not surprising based on its name. And so here's a screen capture of a map. Um, I drew up an iNaturalist or I called up an iNaturalist um, from April 2011. All those red dots are observations of European firebugs that were made um, in Europe, they've, they, you could see they've expanded uh, into a couple other little continents. And there are a few observations in Russia, but mostly they're in Europe. Just a year later, April 2012, there's a little red dot right there um, in, the, in the US. Zooming in a little bit more, that dot is right here in Salt Lake City, where I am. Uh, the first observation of a European firebug in North America ever was on iNaturalist and it was right here in Utah, pretty wild. How did they get here? We have no idea, <laughs> but we do know that they've been um, expanding their range. And so these maps I'm showing you are from iNaturalist and they're based obviously on iNaturalist data, which is people taking images of these insects. So likely the insects were around potentially before this and in a much wider range than what we're seeing. This is just sort of based on the users who are on iNaturalist and, and, they're, um, and them capturing the insects. And so the slide before this was 2012, the data on, I, uh, on firebugs in Utah between 2012 and 2016 is essentially the same. There's really not a lot um, being recorded. In 2016, the numbers sort of start to explode basically. So here we have 2017, 2018, you can see all these red dots um, mean more and more firebugs that are being observed in Utah. Um, coincidentally, 2016 is also when the Natural History Museum started this firebug project on iNaturalist. And so I think it started to spread the word basically, and people were like, oh, I'm gonna start looking for them. And so the more they knew about it, the more they were looking for them and collecting data, which is pretty exciting. 2018, firebugs also, were observed on iNaturalist up in Canada and down in Mexico for the first time. And so now firebugs aren't just in Utah, they're in other parts of North America. Um, and then the following year, they start to expand outside of the state of Utah and they were observed for the first time on iNaturalist in Idaho, outside of Burley. Um, and then here we are, April, 2020, I just took the screenshot today. Um, they've been observed in, in Boise as well 
in Idaho. So they're, they're moving and we want to learn more about them. And so anytime you see a firebug or honestly a box elder bug, take a picture of it, put it on a naturalist and it's going to become some useful data for us, which is pretty exciting. So thanks in advance. Here again is the website for that. Um, it's right on our, our Natural History Museum web page. Another introduced species that I want to touch on is something called the fox squirrel. Fox squirrels uh, are also not native to Utah, and the museum is also studying the spread of this species using iNaturalist. And so fox squirrels are something, depending on where you live in the state, see a lot or not at all. They were first spotted in the Salt Lake Valley in 2011, and they're pretty charismatic Creatures. They're a large squirrel. They have really big bushy tails, this beautiful sort of orange belly, hence the name fox squirrel. Uh, and they're really, they're pretty brave. They're not uh, afraid of people or cats or rats. <laughs> they're just, they're, they're just there. Um, we don't really know how they're impacting the ecosystem here um, at all. And so step one to studying them is understanding what their range is. And so we're still trying to get a good understanding of where exactly they're living in the state. This is a great example of a way that the museum cannot be everywhere all the time to know where fox squirrels are living. Um, but with help of citizen scientists around the state looking for them, um, we're getting a better understanding of, of the spread of this little creature. And so here we have um, some images of other squirrels that live in the state, the fox squirrel, uh, is on the left there. As I mentioned, they have orange bellies. They've got big bushy tails. They're sort of larger. They can be found up in the trees, but they also spend a lot of time on the ground. The native species of tree squirrel that lives in Utah is called the red squirrel. They're much smaller. You can see they have white bellies, um, different markings around their eyes, and they really are exclusively in trees um, or spend most of their time up in trees. The other native squirrel that lives in this part of the state is called a rock squirrel. They're a ground dwelling squirrel. So they're on top of or below the ground. Um, and they're sort of similar size to a fox squirrel, but they've got some different coloration. Uh, anytime you see any squirrel, fox squirrel or not, take a picture of it, put it on a naturalist, and that's super helpful to the museum and our research. Um, are these squirrels living in the same places? Are fox squirrels pushing out the native red squirrel? Do they coexist? What are their nests looking like? There's a, there are a lot of questions that, that the museum zoology team has. Um, so any information you can provide on them is, is super helpful to us. And so the iNaturalist platform is an amazing way to do that. Similar to the firebug, um, here's a map of the US in April, 2013. These are all of the fox squirrels observations that had been recorded. Um, my arrow is pointing to the Great Salt Lake in Utah. April 2014, there's a little red dot that shows up and that's the first time a fox squirrel was um, observed on iNaturalist, though they had, they had been seen in the state before that. And they've since expanded all across the, the Wasatch Front, certainly. The farthest north they've been recorded on iNaturalist is Ogden. The farthest south is Spanish Fork. And then very recently, as of February of this year, there was an observation made just outside of Kimball Junction, up sort of near Swanner. And, um, it's pretty wild because we didn't know they were living up there. And so keep your eyes peeled, take pictures of squirrels for us. Um, because this is this was um, some, I think, scientifically exciting news, but also crazy news to think of it um, being another species. Oh, here are my very delayed arrows pointing to the northern and southern and most eastern observations there. So I've talked about three projects. I've got one more I wanted to wrap up with. Before I do that, I wanted to give a quick plug for something that's already been mentioned, but just to say it again and get you all excited so you come back to the next webinar happening at the end of April. Um, the Natural History Museum studies fireflies, and yes, they do live in the state of Utah. Yes, they have been spotted very near the Swan Art Eco Center. Um, and so there's going to be a presentation on April 29th by Christy Bills, who is the entomologist at the museum. And she'll be talking all about that and I, which is exciting because really fireflies deserve their own whole talk. And so that's perfect because uh, there's no way I could cover all the exciting things about them in a, in a quick little 15 minute blurb. So there's my plug. We look forward to seeing you again on the 29th. <laughs> so in conclusion, the last uh, way you can engage with some natural history museum research is through this 
this event that Rhea mentioned called the City Nature Challenge. And this is a global event that is um, really aimed at collecting data on iNaturalist on global biodiversity. Typically the challenge is a challenge and it's a competition between cities worldwide, like which city can collect the most urban biodiversity data on iNaturalist. Given the state of the world today, the challenge aspect has been removed. And so it's all just this big collaborative effort. The City Nature Challenge is organized by the California Academy of Sciences. They're the ones who started it. Um, and also the Natural History Museum of LA County. And it's grown from the first City Nature Challenge was between LA and San Francisco. And then um, this year will be the fifth year of the challenge. And there are over 200 cities worldwide participating. Utah has been in the challenge for the past four years. And so uh, we're excited to see if we can top our previous year numbers. Um, so we're looking to get more than 3,500 observations on iNaturalist, which I actually feel really confident that we can. Citizen science is a really great way, especially using iNaturalist is a really great way to still be contributing to science and engaging with the community while being socially distant from people. And so if, if you're comfortable um, being outside and you're able to get outside and you can do it in a safe way, this is a really great way to do it. And as research shows, getting outside and interacting and engaging with nature really is a healthy thing for humans to do, both physically and mentally, uh, which is something I think we all need right now. And this is a pretty exciting and fun thing, knowing that any observation you make on iNaturalist during this date range, which is April 24th to the 27th, is going to contribute to the City Nature Challenge and you'll be collaborating with people worldwide to see how many different things we can find. So I hope that you join us for that. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have about citizen science, either today during the webinar, but also in the future, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thanks in advance for helping the Natural History Museum with some of our research. We really couldn't do it without you. So I meant to close my stop sharing my screen so I could say that with my face bigger on the screen. <laughs> uh, really, thanks for your help. And we're so excited to have you join us as a citizen scientist. I'll pass it on to Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Rebecca, I'll Hi. give you sharing privileges right now. Oh, excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. I am a community scientist and a volunteer for the Natural History Museum of Utah. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how I got started into community science and um, how some of the ways that you can be involved too. Uh, so my, I had an interest in bugs and spiders that I've had for years. Uh, that's really was kind of the spark that made a connection. So there's a, a Facebook group run by Christy Bills, who is the entomology collection manager at the museum. Um, this Facebook group called Salt Lake Bug Lovers, and it's it's not just for people in Salt Lake, but uh, all around Utah and beyond a little bit, I think, too. Um, but just uh, people who are passionate about the little critters that are around them and that that was something that I, I liked a lot. Well, while I was on there, she shared the firebug project. And that was my introduction. I had never heard of iNaturalist before. So when I saw sorry, when I saw that on iNaturalist, um, I'm just going to share this again with you real quick. Is it easy to go in and out of sharing. So, you know how, do you remember how to do it? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Perfect. There we go. So the firebug project, I, I had actually just read recently uh, at that time that firebugs were introduced in just recent years to Salt Lake City and that it was really unusual because Normally, when you have an introduced species, it it is introduced on in, in coastal regions or really, really populous cities. 
So to, to find out that the firebug had only been seen in our city in, in North America um, got me excited because I, when I moved into my house, I had found firebugs in the backyard and I knew right away they were not box elder bugs. So when I saw that someone was tracking this, I was excited to take part in it. And I said, you know, you've got a project. I can, I can uh, contribute to this project. So I checked it out on iNaturalist. So you've seen this project here before. Um, I'm just going to show you some of the, oh, that just goes to me. Sorry. <laughs> so these are firebug observations that I've contributed to the project. Um, I was absolutely instantly in love with iNaturalist because it, it was a platform in which I could contribute through observations of living things. And then I also found that I could help identify other people's things. So my knowledge and interest in bugs and spiders was going to be useful, not just for myself anymore. I'm going to share. So this, I started this project of um, my own backyard because as soon as I started my observations, I was finding all kinds of things I had never seen before. And actually this leads me to a quote I want to tell you before I show you anything else. I love this quote. This is from the Curator Collections Manager of the Essig Museum of Entomology at UC Berkeley. It says, really what turned me on to entomology was that there's this world that's all around all the time. We're breathing in insect pheromones right now there are insects right outside the door and nobody sees them. Nobody knows they're there. And when I started studying entomology, they just appeared like the blinders were taken off my eyes. And all of a sudden there was all this life all around me that I started paying attention to. And I walked through the world with a much different vision than I think most people have. So this absolutely was how I felt when I started looking for things in my yard. I was noticing not only the bugs and spiders, but the plants. It's any living thing you can put in an observation of and recording the biodiversity. Um, I, it became a challenge to me. I wanted to find as many species as I possibly could. And it was amazing to me because I live in Glendale, which is pretty much next door neighbor to downtown Salt Lake. So I've got um, industrialville around me and my yard was not well taken care of. It's very weedy. That was something I wanted to record too, was the biodiversity of the weeds. I couldn't remember from year to year what I had figured out that some of them were. So when you take the picture and upload it, um, it will give you an automatic, some automatic uh, suggestions as to what it is that you've seen. Um, but then also the community on iNaturalist will help to identify things and make sure you you know exactly what it is. So I just wanted to show you some examples of things that I found in my yard. Um, these are going out day after day um, in different seasons, sometimes at night. Um, and these are some that I found underneath um, some rotting wood. So turning it over and finding all kinds of life under there. So I take the pictures and upload them and I'm able to find out what I have. And it also contributes to the knowledge that other people will have of what's in our city and what's around them. So there's plants, there are little critters, shells that I've found. Um, some other interesting things that you can take observations of are tracks and and signs of, of things so it doesn't have to be the living organism itself but it can be any sign of it so this is uh, uh, the, the young um, a young box elder tree branch and these little cut marks in it are where um, something like a spittle bug or a leaf hopper has um, oviposited their eggs. So they've cut into the stem there and then later on 
those when those insects are ready to emerge, they kind of chew their way out of there and you get a different looking track. Um, all kinds of interesting things that you can add. I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> I can figure it out. <laughs> Just went to a gray screen now. Did it? Yeah, but we can still see your mouse moving around. <laughs> I wonder. Let's see. Oh, what have I done? That's okay. Do you have more things that you want to share? I, I do. Sorry, not share on the screen, but I have lots more to say. <laughs> Okay, but nothing else on screen? No, I don't believe so. Okay, then I I think I can, you can end unshare. it for you. Let me see if I can. I've got this tiny little window that you're in and I can't figure out how to make it big. Sorry guys, thanks for bearing with us as we figure this out. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Uh, Maybe I cannot change it. Mm. Sorry about that, guys. Well, you can keep talking while we have your your thing up on screen, and I will work on getting it off the screen. How does that sound? Okay, I'm just gonna pull up my notes. So there were two things that happened when I started using um, iNaturalist, and that was making observations which that led me to look for as many species as I could find everywhere. That includes anywhere I travel, that includes in my backyard. Um, when I used to think I was seeing tiny little flies buzzing around a, a bush in my backyard, it turned out when I looked closer that they were, it was a whole mix. There were teeny tiny wasps and tiny bees and hoverflies and this whole biodiversity in what looked like just some flies flying around a bush. So uh, it, when I go camping, things will land on me. And rather than shooing them away, I want to look at what has landed on me and figure out what it is. I want to take pictures of it. So it's just opened my eyes in, and helped me to be aware of the natural world around me in a very different way. That was one thing that happened. The other thing to use my knowledge, like I said, to help identify other people's observations. Um, as I did this, I learned from the community. The iNaturalist community is really helpful um, in, in uh, supporting each other. So I made plenty of mistakes and they would help me learn what mistakes I had made and why, and that led me to learn more and more. So I really started focusing on spiders as that was my, my biggest interest. And over a few years of, of helping and volunteering on iNaturalist, identifying other people's observations and my own, um, I've become extremely knowledgeable about spiders to the point that I have people around the world asking for me to help with identification and um, information about spiders. And I was watching them not just to find out what they were, but also to observe their behavior and look for signs of them, their webs and their egg sacs. And I've learned so much about what is around us and it makes it, makes it really exciting to be out in nature. Um, and also sharing those observations and helping identify all of that, as was mentioned before, is contributing to a scientific database. This is used in research. It's also used in conservation efforts. So when people are looking to find out um, what is declining, what is spreading, what maybe an area has lots of invasive species and they are hoping to change that um, ecosystem to have more native species. Um, the information that they gather through community scientists and iNaturalists can be so helpful in that and, and like, Ellen was saying um, scientists often just can't get out there and, and gather the kind of information that crowdsourcing can. So it's pretty exciting to be part of. Um, 
So I found it really rewarding to be a part of this. Um, the museum also has the projects that she mentioned. There's another that is ongoing that's uh, neighborhood naturalists. And we help out um, the Salt Lake open, I always forget, open spaces, Salt Lake parks and open spaces, <laughs> something like that in some of our, our um, local parks where they're working on, on how they're going to change the environment there, we help by taking observations. And this is part of that community outreach that a lot of people come and help. We've got kids that come and um, people of all ages, because as she said, anyone can be a community scientist. Um, so iNaturalist itself, is a place where you can record and organize your nature findings. So if you're into plants, if you're into, maybe you go to the water a lot, um, you can look at aquatic species. Um, anything that you are observing, you can be putting on iNaturalist and it keeps that organized over the years and allows you to look at it in a lot of, of great ways on maps and through time and um, giving you totals of, of what, what species are you seeing more than any others. Um, it's really cool that way. Um, you also meet other nature enthusiasts and learn about your natural world, about everything around you. Um, so I like that they said on their website, it says, iNaturalist hopes to create extensive community awareness of local biodiversity and promote further exploration of local environments. So I think it really does help as you learn more about the things around you, it helps get you excited to learn more and get out there and and maybe go to places you wouldn't otherwise go or look places you wouldn't otherwise look. So you can be an active member of the iNaturalist community by adding your observations. That can be done on the website or on a, an app that they have for iPhone or Android that is free, of course. Um, the website has has more to it. Um, that's where if you're helping with identifying. Um, so that's the other way that you can be an, an active member of the iNaturalist community is helping other community members to identify their unidentified observations. Um, that's easier to do on the website. The app is is a lot of people's choice for observations because you can just take your phone, have it with you anyway, anywhere you are, you can snap those photos and use the app to upload it right then and there. And it'll often give you uh, a good suggestion of what you're probably looking at. So it also works as a tool to just help identify the things that you might not know what they are. What kind of plant is this? What kind of spider is this? What kind of bird is that? So it helps, helps you right away as well as, as further on. Um, so an observation, just to get technical, is a record of an encounter with an individual organism at a particular time and location. So if you have more than one organism, you'll want to upload more than one observation. That can even be in a single photograph. You can duplicate that photograph to focus on each organism that is in it. Um, and like I was showing you, that includes encounters with signs of organisms like tracks or nests or webs, or even things that have died. There are people that upload um, pictures of roadkill because they've actually learned a lot by looking at the roadkill and, and it's helped to extend some of the known ranges of things. So anytime you're seeing a living organism or something that once was living, um, that can be useful information. Um, so I think just to kind of wrap up my thoughts, again, anyone can do it and it can be such a fantastic way to get more in touch with the world around you. So I, I highly recommend it. And of course, it's only one way, it's one tool that we use for community science, citizen science. There are many others, but iNaturalist is a very all-encompassing tool for, for living things. So oh, I appreciate you having me on here. Um, I hope that uh, working with iNaturalist and being a community scientist gets you excited about things as well. Rebecca?
All right, next we have Hope. Hope, I already gave you the presenter privileges, so hopefully you can share whenever you're ready. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, first of all, thank you for putting this on. I think this is such an important topic, and I'm really honored to be here with um, the other panelists. It's so fun to hear about all the other projects that are going on um, and fellow bug nerds. I love bugs. My earrings are actually dragonflies. I don't know if you can see that at all, but um, I love bugs. So this is just really fun. I love being part a part of um, things like this. So I'm going to try sharing my PowerPoint here. All right. You guys can see that, yes? Okay, great. <laughs> so, yeah, so my name is Hope Breakway and I work for Utah State University. Um, I'm the coordinator for Utah Water Watch, and that's Utah's citizen science water quality monitoring program. So I'll just give you a very brief overview of this presentation. I'm going to go pretty quick because I want to hear your questions and, and hear more about other opportunities um, for citizen science, but I'll brief, briefly go over um, why, to, why do we care about water quality um, and what is Utah Water Watch? And if you're interested, how you can get involved um, and any questions too. So why do we care about water quality? Um, water is essential to life. All animals, including people need it, plants need it, we all need it to survive. Um, Utah is, has a great need for water quality monitoring. Um, we are a very dry state. So there's over 2,000 lakes and almost 15,000 miles of permanent streams. Um, if you count intermittent streams, it's over 18,000 miles. So um, we do have quite a bit of water, even though we are a dry state. Um, and to effectively monitor these water bodies, um, it's really important. If we have um, such a, a small amount of water in terms of other places throughout the, the country, the quality of that water really matters. If we have a lot of water, but it's um, polluted and not very useful to, to plants and animals and all of us. So the quality um, is also related with quantity too. We want to respond to um, current concerns or issues that are going on with our, with our water quality, and that can include harmful algal blooms, um, E. coli monitoring, all those kinds of things too. So what is Utah Water Watch? Um, so our mission is to encourage, educate, and engage volunteers monitoring water quality. Um, we provide the knowledge, the training, all of the equipment, everything you need to actually go out and examine um, the health of our lakes and streams in Utah. So we really want to know or get citizens involved and in, in noticing natural changes. Um, if you go out to a river in May, it's going to look very different than uh, September. Um, and so noticing natural changes, but then also if there's um, human caused changes too as well. And then encouraging citizens to be advocates of their local water bodies. You're the ones that are out there. You're actually seeing from a day-to-day -day, um, perspective what the water looks like, what is going on there. Um, it's impossible for me or for um, the monitoring crew with the Utah Division of Water Quality um, to be everywhere all at once. And so it's really important to have people that actually live in the area, that actually know those places um, out there monitoring. And then to help protect those water bodies, um, because you know what those water bodies are like naturally and normally. So this is a partnership between Utah State University Extension and also the Utah Division of Water Quality. Um, it started in 2012. Um, there was a Utah Lake Watch before that. Um, and that went for about eight years and was really useful, but um, Utah Water Watch kind of tried to expand um, that program to also streams and other wetlands and then increase the amount of parameters that volunteers are monitoring. Um, and you can see from this picture, we do everything from dissolved oxygen, turbidity, um, pH, and I can go into more what those things actually are later if you're, if you're curious. Um, but since 2012, we've trained over 500 volunteers and they've monitored over 250 sites all across Utah, which is really amazing. Um, so what do volunteers get if you are, if you want to become a volunteer? Um, so again, we provide the training, we provide all of the equipment that you need. Um, hopefully you gain a very deep understanding of the importance of water quality 
um, able to collect water quality data that's important um, and help protect our local lakes and streams. And all of that data that's collected is actually available on a publicly accessible um, database. It's on our website and um, shared with the Utah Division of Water Quality so they can use that data as well. So who can volunteer? That's the wonderful thing about citizen science is anyone can. Um, so it's this Utah Water Watch is a free program. It's open to volunteers of all ages, all backgrounds. Um, we've had so many different groups. There's people that like to go boating or anglers. Um, we have a lot of great teachers that get their students involved. So there's fourth grade students out monitoring water quality um, and high school students and, and really people of all, all ages. We have um, community groups, church groups, um, individuals just that want to go out. And so it's amazing that really anyone can go out and do this. Um, so Utah Water Watch, we're flexible. We do require a small monthly time commitment. And this is generally, the monitoring season is generally April through October, um, but that's also very site specific. I've talked to a few volunteers that are saying, with the snowpack, there's no way I can get to my site until May or June, or so that's, we're flexible with that. We understand that um, sites can vary a lot from place to place. Um, and it takes about 30 minutes per site visit um, for those seven months. So if this sounds like something you are interested interested in and you want to get involved, um, these are kind of my three basic steps to, to getting involved. Um, and I'll show you our website in just a moment. But the first is to um, go to our website and fill out our volunteer registration form. Um, and then attend a workshop. And there's actually a workshop. It's our first online training. I've never done an online training. It's going to be really exciting. Uh, that's happening this Saturday, so April 11th. And then we'll also have one in May. That's another online training. Um, so the great thing about monitoring water quality is this can be something you can do right now. Obviously, make sure that you're following um, local regulations and directives, um, but getting outside and, and being at a lake or river is a, a wonderful thing to do um, anytime, but I feel like right now is a great time for it too. And then we will work with you to choose a site that you can monitor. So we work with the um, Utah Division of Water Quality. We work with them to find sites that they need help on, that they need um, more eyes on. And then also a site that's close to you or that's meaningful to you as a volunteer. Um, we're not gonna have you drive 50 miles to a different spot if, if it's not a place that you like to go. If it's a, if it's a pond down the road or if it's a, a stream that's next to your backyard, that's that's going to be the place that we'll, we'll work with you to monitor. So this is our website. Um, and if you just Google Utah Water Watch, it should come up. Um, but it's also extension.usu.edu slash Utah Water Watch. And you can find all this information and a lot more um, on our website. And then I know we'll probably do questions and other things later, but this is just my contact info if you have other questions. Um, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, so feel free to reach out. And um, yeah, thanks again. And obviously, yes, dragonflies, that's what my thesis was on. I just love, I love stoneflies and mayflies and all, all other insects, but dragonflies kind of have my heart. <laughs> so thank you. And let me make sure. Stop sharing. There we go. <laughs> thanks, Go. Okay. Got a lot of bug nerds here today. I'm a big bug nerd, so <laughs> we all found. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I do. We do have one question already, um, which might be a good question for Ellen. And you guys have uh, kind of worked with this in the past before. This is from Marianne Erdman, who is the curator of education for the Brigham City Museum. So thank you for joining us. Um, and she was wondering what uh, to do to accommodate low income families and others with little or no access to smartphones and tablets to participate in things like the city nature challenge. Which may be a bit different this year as it's a more of a virtual event. That's right. That's right. But in a traditional, it's a great question, Marianne, and for outreach purposes, when we do events. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, especially since I see that so we don't have libraries open right now. Um, so with 
when, when the Natural History Museum goes and to do citizen science events, bioblitz events, where we're going into parks and, and recording species using iNaturalist, we have a, a little cadre of tablets that we bring with us to share with attendees who come so they can utilize those. And we'll bring those to schools and all sorts of outreach programs. And so we'll, we'll bring it and then they can use it. Um, I, I will say that I find during events, most people do have smartphones. Um, so it's a pretty common thing, though obviously not everybody, not everybody does. And certainly uh, if you're engaging with kids, not everyone is able to use that sort of stuff. And so um, when you can interact with people, having materials that you can bring for people to use is fabulous. Um, but in terms of City Nature Challenge this year, there's nothing I can really actively do to help people um, in terms of making iNaturalist observations. But that said, we are developing some other materials uh, for the City Nature Challenge and also some of our summer programming that um, might be getting shifted around um, from its traditional the traditional ways we've been hosting them. Um, we're going to be coming up with some other online materials that uh, can be printed off or just used. Um, even honestly, you could even just you know draw it out. We're going to come up with some bingo sheets and some species list of lists of fun things that you could find in your backyard, things that you're likely to see in and around your home. Um, and those are things that you could just, if you have access to a computer, read about and then you know share it with share it with kids. Um, I'm not sure if that's entirely getting to your question. Um, free to clarify more if you have follow-ups. Yeah, I think that definitely um, answers a lot of questions for me and um, things are changing so quickly with our current situation that everyone's trying to figure it out and be flexible, um, especially with these events that like you've done year after year. So things are gonna be a little bit different than normal. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or anything, comments? that they've done in the past that they've enjoyed and naturalist things they've done or anything don't have any other questions but um, if anyone has anything else that they wanted to say before we wrap things up at all um, oh I want to Ellen are you gonna say something <laughs> Well, if, if not, if you're going to wrap stuff up, I was, I was just going to thank you all again for, for hosting this, this forum. And I wanted to say just to everybody listening in to keep your eyes peeled for other citizen science things that are happening. I think especially in the coming months as um, the museums and, and uh, <coughs> awesome Swanner eco centers that we usually are going to to visit and engage with are, are, are closed. There are still great ways that you can be contributing to those places and, um, and and we're all thinking of fun ways to keep engaging with you too. So keep your eyes peeled and, and I will also say that if anyone has ideas about things that they would love to see happening um, or would would appreciate having materials for um, or you have thoughts on any of that stuff, I, I suspect I know that I am interested to hear that and I suspect um, that my colleagues who are on the call would be as well and so because you know, we're all adapting to this together. <laughs> um, and so if, if, if there are things that you're interested about, especially citizen science related and things like even questions you have about nature in your own neighborhoods and you'd like to talk to somebody, um, for example, at the Natural History Museum about that, be in touch with me or others who might be the right people to answer those questions and, and we'd be psyched to talk to you. Um, that's hey, Ellen. Yeah, that's another thing. So uh, just for anyone who's listening or watching this later uh, on our website, as far as like other citizen science opportunities that there are, um, I'm sure that you guys have more listed on NHMU site, but also um, if you go to the homepage of the Swanner website, which is just swannerecocenter.org, there's uh, our Solus page, which is our new uh, dealing with COVID-19 uh, website with all sorts of resources. There are some links to uh, some opportunities for other citizen science things as well. So if anyone is interested in that, you're welcome to go to our website to check those out too. But uh, we're just sharing things that we're finding. So Ellen is definitely the expert and Ellen and Hope and Rebecca all have the most information. Yeah, uh, there's one more question from Joan. Any other citizen science? There's definitely, this is just a couple projects that are out there. There are 
pretty much endless projects that you can get involved in, and a lot of them are virtual. Um, I have put a couple on our website, like Hunter mentioned, um, things like eBird, which are tracking birding observations, which we use on all of our bird tours. That contributes to data. Um, and things like Zooniverse, where you can go search through projects and um, help people all over the world. So there's a few that we've put up on our website. This is just highlighting a couple of our awesome local partners that we love and projects that we're really excited about, but there is plenty more out there to get involved in and new projects coming up all the time as well. If I could follow up on it, yeah, there, I know just off the top of my head, I can think of some others that, that I love. There's an amazing Pelican research project coming out of Westminster. They've got they Pelicams up on Gunnison Island, which is in the Great Salt Lake, and you can go to Zooniverse and help them look through just mountains of, of Pelican photos and help identify some cool data there. Um, and there's also some citizen science related research coming out um, related to the, the earthquake that happened a few weeks ago and recording things um, and sending in photographs related to that. Um, and so there are always new exciting local things happening based on where you are in the state. Um, and really this is a whole statewide thing. I think some of the things I talked about were pretty Wasatch Front um, or in Wasatch Back specific, uh, but there are things happening all over. Thanks, Ellen. And you can definitely find projects about what you're interested in as well. If you're like, I don't really like fireflies very much. I don't like insects, which maybe this group wouldn't understand, but um, things like the Pelicam or eBird, if you're really into birds, if you're not into biology, um, there's tons of other projects out there. Like Ellen said, there's projects where you can help analyze space data, uh, things like the earthquake, if you're into geology and um, geophysics. So there's options for everybody. You don't have to be bug nerds like us or bird nerds or anything. Um, you can find a project that fits your uh, interests. Cool. Um, yeah, we'd love any future questions for people watching this in the future. Um, we'll put Hunter and myself will put our contact info. Um, if anyone else is open to questions, we can share your contact info as well. People can reach out uh, to get involved in projects. Um, I just want to say thank you to our panelists so much for spending your Thursday evening with us and um helping to get people excited about community science uh and thanks so much to our attendees who joined us as well and great questions um we'll be posting this online and sharing it through different channels like social media um in our newsletter so whenever you're watching this reach out with your questions even if we can't answer them in real time here so thanks guys thank you so much for doing this this was wonderful Thank you all. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for coming, everyone. We loved having you. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Stay safe and healthy out there. Do science. Yeah. Bye. Thanks.